So, good evening. I had some more mail from Germany today and um, I have gotten the service manual on DVD from Mercedes-Benz, which is on this thing here. And now I basically have everything complete. I have the, the ones you can purchase online from, you know, various retailers, a copied version or what have you, whatever that might be. And then I also have the book, thanks to Mac, out in Georgia. And I got now the official service documentation with service bulletins and a complete parts list, as well as manuals and other parts of it. So I looked at it to, uh, to have some <clears throat> comparison. Mercedes-Benz, of course, is a very large corporation. And they have different divisions and departments and this, that, and the other thing. And everyone publishes something when these cars are in production. And it is somewhat a little bit difficult to get all the information. Well, anyway, since this is an addendum to the uh, higher idle speed at uh, when the engine is warm, which could be somewhat at random, I looked on the DVD one today when I was in the office where I have a DVD player built in and I came up Inhalt Fehler Informationen. This is the uh, particular bulletins and all the way on the bottom you can hardly read this. It says here, Lela auf Drehzahl, Betriebstemperatur zeitweise 1100 RPM. And that means the RPM, the idle speed RPM at operating temperature is uh, intermittently at 1100 RPM. Service bulletin was AF07.32P-6400X. And that is the actual service bulletin here and it is applicable to uh, engine 116 beginning September 1st 85 107 108 126 and the 117 engine beginning September 1st 85 107 116 126 it was uh, finalized this is the version here June 1st of 1990 and it was then actually uh, uh, made permanent, more or less, on August 25th, 98, when the, uh, pro the problems increased. And basically, what they're saying in here is the, to test the switch um, on the throttle body, the throttle switch. And then if that doesn't fix it, if you can find the problem, then uh, they suggest to, uh, to replace the actual throttle body. That's basically what it boils down to. And then they have here on the side RA 7.3152. Oops, you can't see the story. RA 7.3152 uh, and RA uh, 7.3230. These are the sections in the manual under group 7.3. 230 would be the first one that is the actual Klappenstutzen is the throttle body and they have actually referred me even I had put in the 129.039 model to the older 380 and uh, 500 version of the 126 and that's the throttle body you're looking at and then down here is a part you may want to write down which is this here it is 117-993-0310 because that is the spring, the return spring. You may also want to check in the case that your your throttle uh, gets stuck because that is the issue behind this whole thing. Now, I want to recap this because and this is the reason why I made the video is um, I had shared in my videos about eight months or nine months is already in the big repair I went through and I showed you my manifold intake system when I redid the entire manifold system and one part of that or one chapter or two chapters are dealing with the throttle body with that very particular issue. And as you can see here is I have this gunk in here this is carbon deposits and I had a leak 
in my fuel distributor and that was basically causing this. Did I take a picture of it? No, unfortunately I don't have a picture of my fuel distributor. Yes, I do. The fuel distributor on my car was already remanufactured. You can see this, we have the correct one on, that's the Bosch 438-101-018. You can either use a 017 or 018. Uh, it doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> And that was remanufactured in America. And these fuel distributors when Mercedes Benz or Bosch had them remanufactured. Um, they had a sales price of four and a half thousand to six and a half thousand dollars, just that you have an idea of what they used to charge for them. So this was already the second fuel distributor on there. The first one, the original one, probably went out, and that probably happened maybe all at the same time or earlier than the timing chain. And that's when the car was bought in and Mercedes-Benz sold them that. And this is probably the same age. My actual throttle body is, I would point this about 15 years ago. So what this did is the, this is the underside actually of the plate, this is the top side. I can tell you, I think that's the top side with the carbon on it. And you can see the carbon deposits in here. And this is what Mercedes-Benz is talking about in this service bulletin, which they issued, because this was the problem they were experiencing for quite some time. <clears throat> and in my instance, the carbon deposits actually became a molasses because of the leaking fuel distributor. It leaked right out of the piston, out of the plunger, basically, the part which hits the plate mechanism and it dripped into the boot and then from the boot it started to drip into the lower intake manifold under the plate so i had this gunk in here and what would happen with this here was it was hot when the engine was cold as cold it got as harder the thing was and it more difficult it actually moved so it almost locked the throttle body up does the plate the throttle plate couldn't uh, it couldn't open properly, <clears throat> plus the venturi holes I had in there for the vacuum were all clogged up from this stuff. And then once the engine warmed up, uh, everything became hunky dunky dory basically. And so this was my particular situation when I did this, or what I found in my car. And um, the more common one is where the, um, where you have no fuel leak, you're gonna encounter this here. Oops, let me show you this. This is a picture I found on eBay for a listing for a used throttle bottle. This is what these throttle bottles will look like it after 15 years, 20 years of uh, 100,000, 150, 200,000 mile range. And now what happens is there are two bearings on each side, which are driven in and they are into the housing into the throttle housing one is basically hidden behind the switch and the other one i believe has a cap on it you can take off and these are needle nose bearings you can see this they're a little bit wider they're very small little needle nose bearings and they hold the uh, uh, the shaft for the plate and the plate is centered in there and what will happen is this build up that dust and the uh, carbon deposits because it sits in that lower part and all that air is sucked in when they start to leak and bypass air that will go get into the bearings and the bearings will go out and so that's why these units have to be replaced i do not know if mercedes-benz still sell uh, they have them and the sale price is somewhere with which I think between $250 to $290 or $300. Um, there's a fellow on eBay who sells them remanufactured and they're charging $550 for them. I do not understand why with a $50 core deposit, $100 core deposit. I don't know why. Anyway, I wind it up because I didn't know about this particular service bulletin here. The uh, P6400X under group uh, 732. But if you look at my, if this plate, and you can see the carbon here on the side, then you know you have to do something. 
and this was basically it. So what I winded up doing is I cleaned it. My favorite cleaning solution is gasoline, as crazy as this sounds. And you can see I have some residue here left. And the reason for this was I did not take the plate out because this plate is very, very difficult to adjust in because it has such a tiny, tiny clearance. And uh, the process of doing this is really for someone who has real steady hands and can work with a ten thousands of a millimeter or thousands of a millimeter, or hundreds of a millimeter, something like this, uh, you know, with these filo gauges. That is too, too small for me. Well, anyway, I got this cleaned up. This is only with gasoline. And then I checked it. So I have completely free movement in there. I did not take a picture, I think. See, this is when I did the vacuum ports. This is the vacuum port which goes to the um, uh, switch over valve for the vacuum canister for the fumes. This is the top one here which goes to the EGR valve system, first to the uh, vacuum temperature switch on the upper intake manifold and the lower one is uh, to go to this valve here which activates this valve so this one turns on at a lower temperature and at a lower rpm where this turns on at a higher temperature i think at operating temperature 80 or 85 degrees celsius this one starts to switch in with the temperature vacuum temperature switch at about 50 or 55 degrees celsius and you can see this here there's a date stamp on there which is in the 80s i can't read it exactly but this is probably the original one what saved me here was I cleaned these holes out. These are the three holes you can see, and they have to be clear, otherwise your vacuum will not work. And the fourth vacuum, where you also have to be, this is the underside. I wind it up then cleaning off the uh, uh, the gasket uh, stuff. This was before I had that fully scraped off there. And this is how clean the underside came, came out. This is the condition it is now. And my shaft is completely freely moving and I have no obstructions in the bearings whatsoever. They're perfect. And this is when I started to reassemble this and I adjusted the gap between switching or being from the switch being in idle speed position, the on off position. And you use a 0 0.007, that's when it has to turn on. And at 0 0.008, it has to be off. So when you put the eight in, you and you put a continuity tester on between one and two i believe that's the two ports uh it will then um go on uh, is off and then when you when you put this 0.007 or seven mil feeler gauge in there which is about 0 0.178 millimeters that's when the switch has to activate so <clears throat> that is the switching point and i will put the link of this video where I show the setup of this in the bottom of the description of this. One thing I wanted to point out here was, um, so the, first of all, the question is not so much, uh, can you, you know, do you have to buy a new or remanufactured uh, throttle body? No, I would say. If you clean the entire body up and you let that soak, then it will depend on what condition the two bearings are in. And these bearings, you remove the two, the switch out, and you can see as the shaft protrudes past the bearing, the bearing sits about here and on the other side where the linkage is. Uh, you can see this, there's a little round spot there where that bearing sits in. They can be pulled out. You have to get a puller, a bearing puller, which pulls them in out from the inside against the shaft and then you can get them out and it helps when you use a heat gun and you basically heat up the uh, uh, throttle body itself and then you can replace them with high grade stainless steel uh, NSK bearings or SKF you know whatever your preferred uh, make or model is their metric so if you match them up to the shaft that should work Normally, the stuff really doesn't wear out, but if you have dirt in there, like uh, with no lubrication, that dry stuff, like I uh, showed you in that, in, in this unit here, um, then you may encounter an issue that the bearings actually uh, jump. And what this does is it doesn't, it's, it doesn't close the, uh, 
the plate fully when you when you get off the pedal of the gas of the accelerator and then the switch doesn't engage and now the uh, your few uh, the um, ezl unit gets the signal and the um, uh, the uh, ecs the engine control unit the ecu uh, they basically idle up and the way you can test this without even taking a part is simply when you have this issue that you have a high idle when it is warm then go ahead and pull the plug of this cable or the uh, connector which is on top of that bottom piece it is sitting right next to the start, uh, cold start valve it's a little bit tricky to get to but you can get underneath it with two fingers just lift this off it will not throw an hour and uh, if there's no difference in rpm and you plug it back in then you know this is going to be your issue either the switch is out or the whole throttle bottle has locked up and it can go like in my case because of the gasoline i had in there it went the opposite direction it got uh, more flexible or more movable old system when the engine was warm with this kind of a situation here it's going to go exactly the opposite way it is these little particles will expand with heat and they will lock the shaft in the bearing uh, won't move and then the spring won't be able to pull this thing all the way shut that's another reason why I showed you that part number for the spring because these springs also tend to wear out. I got a new spring in there with my system which I didn't mention in the other video. So if that's the case, if you pluck it, if you pull it out and the idle say like you at 900 or 1000, this is where I'm at with my issue because of the timing chain related issues as I explained in the other videos, uh, then it will go up to 1100 I plug it back in, it goes back to 900, 950, 1000. There's like 100 to 200 RPM drop in there. And then when I unplug the vacuum line, because I have a higher vacuum than what I should have, then the, on the EZL unit, then everything goes back down to the regular 650, uh, 600 RPM, 650, 750, somewhere around there. And I plug the vacuum back in, the RPM, the advance comes up because the vacuum is too high and it tells my EZL, even though the switch is working correctly, that my <clears throat> that it needs a higher advance because from the vacuum amount you got, you would be at 950. So it, it advances everything and that pulls the whole engine back up. And this is coming in my case from the timing chain. Mercedes-Benz has never issued a, uh, a service bulletin for that particular issue. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, on this DVD here, as I said earlier, is that they referred me to the correct uh, drawings. Let me just see where I got this. Uh, not drawings, I mean to the process. And um, what you can see here is that this is for the 380. Like I said, this, but I put 129.039 in there, which should get me to a different part of the manual. And you can see this here very nicely. This is the original manual for the early 126s for the 3.8 and 5.0 liter in 152. This has nothing to do with language. And this is the same section as this one here. Let me zoom out. I got it. And in the book, in the uh, later version for the 126 from 86 on till 91. So this already uses my throttle body. Um, so you can see there are some minute differences. One of the big differences between the 3.8 liter and 5 liter is that the gap for the switch is 0.3 millimeter when it has to turn off in idle position. And on the on my unit on the 4.2 and 5.6 that is 0.2 millimeter so they changed it and that's something i wanted to point out this is why i work usually with multiple manuals on downloaded paper form or printed form book form and then factory and this way you can get exactly to the point where you need unfortunately mercedes-benz the only place they ever had everything together 
was on microfilm. And once they went away from microfilm, the digital stuff, everything almost went to hell in a handbasket. Um, I hope that this explains the issues, the possibilities of how the throttle body is involved. Of course, there's many uh, videos out there and on these bulletin boards, people have talked about checking the entire linkage. There's the, the rear part where that long arm attaches, which then has that level of which goes to this unit here that has to have some play. If it doesn't have play, that play, thing can be kept open too. But genuinely, if your throttle looks like this, or this here, um, then it's probably time to do the entire intake manifold overhaul like I did in my video. And like I said, is I'm gonna put the video on how to adjust the switch to clearance correctly um, in the link below. This is actually the plug here on the side which you can see, and this is the connector on top of it. So when you plug this, when you unplug it, the idle RPM should go up. When you plug this back in, it should go down. This way, you know, this plate and that switch is closed in the correct position. And uh, of course, there is a, that's something I should point out too, but normally that doesn't, doesn't change. You can actually see it in the video. There is an end stop. There's a screw with a nut. And unfortunately, I have no picture here for you to show, unfortunately. It is under this arm here on this side. And this is the final resting point here too. And there's somewhere uh, another manual where that is described on how you actually center the plate like they do on the uh, fuel airflow plate assembly unit, the one where the distributor sits on and has the boot underneath and the boot actually connects here. Um, that has to be set up correctly too, which it was in my uh, case. So you actually push this level all the way down so the plate is closed. And then this plate has to be in a, in a free moving, uh, it has to be fully sealed, but it is basically not locked in it cannot wedge up so this place has this plate has to be centered quite perfectly this is another thing what can happen is with dirt build up on those things is uh, when they get warm the plate expands out with the body and the dirt in it expands more because it is a different material it's not aluminum or cast material or steel and that will then wedge this thing in there where it could lock itself actually up and you're trying to step on it and you have to step on it really hard and then it opens up suddenly and then it goes back and, you, and it won't close fully. That's another issue too. So this is all carbon dust dirt related and in my case on top of this gasoline which turned all of the stuff into a molasses and that changed uh, you know everything here. Sorry my camera moved here a little bit. Um, that's basically what I wanted to share with you as an addendum, as another possible cause. If you have fixed this, like I have on my engine, and I have, uh, you know, all new uh, fuel injectors on there, and I have a new rebuilt distributor on there, and the plate uh, resting point is set correctly, and the uh, uh, on-off ratio is set correctly, and everything else, and you have that idle where it doesn't quite go up to 1100 but say like 900 950 a thousand that varies somewhere around there but it never quite goes <clears throat> back down to 650 or 700 or 600 then that comes from the chining timing chain and from the valves that i can tell you for sure so these are the trouble spots in the system and whenever we are diagnosing a car, when you're repairing a car, everything is done by elimination. So if that's not the cause, what is, then you look for the next thing and you rule it either in or out. And then you can make a final determination of where actually the arrow is coming from. Um, I will make another video tomorrow on the cold start valve, which is the one which sits right next to this connector. Um, 
or as Mercedes-Benz calls it, the starting valve, which is really misleading because it is a cold start assist in technical terms. And the cold start assist works only at minus 10 degrees Celsius. And I believe, huh, what is minus 10? Is that zero degrees uh, Fahrenheit? It is, it is somewhere around there. It is, it is right around, let me see what minus 10 degrees C is. See what our computer says here, it's a little bit slow. Uh, yeah. This is the oldest laptop I got and here's at home here because I do only that kind of stuff I'm I'm doing here right now. So minus ten C to F I did this a lot because I can't remember all these things. 14 degrees. So when the temperature goes below 14 degrees Fahrenheit, 13 degree Fahrenheit, the, the temperature sensor B112 will have a resistance of around 10 kilo ohms or a little bit above. And um, that signal goes to the ECU. And from there, it goes as a voltage signal now not as a resistive measurement, as a cleaned up uh, voltage signal to the idle speed control unit and to the fuel pump relay. And when the fuel pump relay senses that temperature converted into volts on that pin, it will activate the cold start valve or the starting valve for two seconds with the fuel pump and then during the entire cycle as long as you're cranking. And that sprays fuel directly into the intake of the cylinder number five. And the reason why they did five is because the firing order is one, five, four. So that will be the second cylinder firing. And that's when this whole thing actually comes alive. And these valves have a nasty habit and they're, they're working like regular electrically operated fuel injectors and um, they get a 12 volt signal and they open up they have a spray pattern the same as the regular fuel injectors and uh, there's an o-ring in there and that o-ring gets hard for one and it shrinks over time and um, this is one of the major causes of the hot start issues when the car doesn't start between the accumulator in the rear next to the fuel pump and the cold starting valve. In the cold starting valve or the, the starting valve as Missy Dispense calls it, usually uh, gets very little attention. And I found a video, a training video from Volkswagen because Volkswagen implemented the CIS system to almost every German car manufacturer did. And they all have to the say, they all work exactly the same principle and that cold start valve is exactly the same on a Jetta and on a Rabbit and on a Scirocco from the 80s, the fuel injected version of those three cars, or on a Porsche, or on a BMW, or on a Volvo, wherever you got those in there, as the one you got built in there was a universal one. They have different connectors for the fuel connection, but the valve essentially is the same and they all work by the same principle. Some engine uh, manufacturers uh, do it at a, at a lower temperature, a higher temperature. Um, Mercedes-Benz determined it was minus 10 degrees uh, F, uh, Celsius, C, Celsius, and, um, which is 14 F, when that starts to spray in. And Volkswagen may have done it because it's only a little four-cylinder engine. They may have done it at a say like at five degrees or 10 degrees or minus five degrees, who knows what temperature it is. I'm not that familiar with it, but it works after the same principle. And they showed it in their hot start problems. And I will explain that in the other video. Um, those should be replaced or ported off because once they leak, they will leak when there is no fuel pressure on there. And with the accumulator basically pushing against it, it will uh, seal 
And then when you turn the engine off and the accumulator reduces the pressure over time, there will be a point when that gasket has shrunk too much and is too hard and the thing starts to leak right into the area of cylinder number five. And you will smell that by fumes, first of all, when the engine set like for overnight or you had turned it off for a couple hours, three hours and it gets cold, you can smell it. And usually that smell disappears after about one minute or two minute of operation. And once that thing is fully leaking, um, because the hot start issue usually uh, happens, say like within an hour after shutting it off, because the accumulator is supposed to be putting the pressure up for at least a half an hour. So after one to two hours of sitting, even in hot weather, you have a problem starting it. And that primarily comes from that valve because it goes exactly into cylinder number five. But we will get into that in detail tomorrow in the other video. And with that, you have a great night.